Hi guys, welcome to the Coffee Break Interview Video Podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan Ho, and I'm your host today. Today, our special guest is Dr. Chris Griffin. He is a speaker, author, full-time dentist, productivity expert, and a podcaster. Welcome to the show, Chris. How are you today? Man, it's it's a pleasure to be here, Nathan. I'm doing great. You're doing great. Just got through with a long Wednesday, and I'm super glad to sit down and talk to you and take a break. Thank you. It's uh, it's such a privilege and an honor to have you on this video podcast. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. I'll just go ahead and apologize to everybody for my accent. If you can't understand me, I apologize, but there's not much I can do about it. <laughs> I can un- understand you just fine. I'm from Texas, so I might sound like a cowboy and, a, and an Asian dude. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, before we start, I'd like to read your bio for, for some of the members that haven't heard about you yet, okay? Um, okay. Dr. Griffin is on a mission to help local dentists work less, make more, and enjoy practicing dentistry. Uh, he is a solo general dentist who focuses on work-life balance to be present for his family as much as possible. In 2007, Dr. Griffin was feeling the effects of the daily grind on his personal and professional life that led him to cut his dental work week down from five days per week to three days per week starting in 2008. Much to his surprise, his practice grew by 20% that year, even though he worked much less. In 2009, Dr. Woody Oaks titled Dr. Griffin the most efficient man in dentistry and featured him at his fall seminar. That exposure launched him into a secondary career as a dental speaker, sharing his message of working less and making more uh, to dentists all across the country. What a great bio. I know it's, uh, it's a lot longer, uh, but I'm going to ask you more about it in, in this video. So uh, let's start with your journey in dentistry. When did you open your first dental practice? Well, first off, let me apologize for the length of that bio. I really had no idea that uh, I sent you that. So I apologize for that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, I'll tell you. In, uh, so I got out of school in 1998, right? And I went into an associateship. And you can you imagine... I know it's surprising, but I had a terrible experience in my associateship, right? So um, after one year, I said, look, I just can't do this. I can't work for anybody else. So in 1999, I opened my, my dental practice. Awesome. 1999. Uh, and I, I heard that you have a very successful dental practice. But before that, it got burned down. So uh, what, what kind of uh, effect uh, d- 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 does that have on you? Well, hey, let me tell you real quick. Let me let me set the stage for you uh, before, because that's a that is a demarcating event in my life. So okay. So like so so in 1999, right? Uh, I get out of school and I I just want to be this. I mean, I've been out for a year and I wanted to be. I, I had in my mind this dream that I could be. I know it's crazy, like the best cosmetic dentist uh, in the country, or at least in the southeast, or for sure Mississippi, right? <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, so, you know, so I went to all the uh, institutes you could go to back then, uh, and they're great institutes. I wouldn't badmouth any of them. I went to LVI. I went to Dawes, Pete Dawson's Continuum, went to all those. I went to a lot of, I, I got my uh, FAGD um, by the time I was 29 years old. Uh, that's wow. how much continuing education I did right then. And I did everything you could do, but guess what I learned? In Ripley, what? Mississippi, a completely fee-for-service cosmetic dental practice will not pay the bills. So, <laughs> so I learned that. Uh, okay. And so like I butted my head against a wall until 2005. So 2005, I'm like, look, Chris, you don't mind working hard. Heck, we gr- I grew up on a farm for goodness sake, right? Just forget this foolishness. Everybody in town's on this terrible PPO. Nobody wants to take it. Just take the PPO and see what happens. At least you'll have somebody in the chair, right? And sure enough, I discovered that as long as people were coming into the practice, I could figure out a way to efficiently get them through. And so instead of getting $1,500 for a crown, I was happy in that day. In those days, I was getting like 500 bucks on this PPO for a crown, but I was doing three of them in the time that I would have probably taken for the $1,500 one that I wasn't doing anyway, because nobody was coming in. Right. So yeah. that's back when I, I really got into that efficiency stuff. Uh, Dr. Woody Oaks, you know, he, he, uh, he was, he's always a great mentor to me. I love, I love Woody. He's a super guy. 
sort of took me under his wing, had me speaking. And, um, and so I, I showed a lot of my systems to his people and it just sort of went from there. So then 2007, I'm blowing and going, man. I I feel like in the last two years, I've just become a genius. I went from, you know, near bankruptcy to now I'm near genius status, right? Uh, <laughs> but I'm working five days a week. And I'm like, you know what? I got these little kids. I know you, Nathan, you got little kids, right? Yeah, I have two. But yeah. So I had these three little kids and I'm like, I don't want to work all the time. And so um, I remember the moment it happened. Like I, I have a farm also. Uh, my family's had a farm that's been farmed for a hundred straight years. So like the pressure's on for me, right? To not <laughs> let it slip, even though I don't like making any money from it. But uh, I'm out and that year we were growing watermelons. Um, and so around in Mississippi, there's this terrible weed they call the devil's tomato, right? And it's got these terrible thorns on it. And it'll get in these watermelon vines. And it'll, it'll make picking watermelons miserable. So you really mm. need to get them out. So I was out hoeing the watermelon field. And it was hot, sweating. And I was like, man, you know, I want my kids to learn how to do this farming. And I want to do stuff with them. And I'm working too much dental office. I'm just going to, what would happen if I just went and worked three days a week? And I worked, you know, pretty hard, nine or 10 hours a day, whatever. But I only work three days a week. I would have so much more time to do this stuff that I want to do. And um, so I just did it, man. I cut the cord in 2008. And uh, it, I, I had just said to myself, you know, Chris, if you can just like maintain $125,000 a month going to three days a week, that would be a miracle. That would be so great. And you wouldn't even have to do that good. But that's our goal, right? Yeah. And um, and. I don't know how it happened, but we actually went up $250,000 that year. And I think a lot of it had to do with the systems because I was so, man, from the summer of 2007 till we pulled the plug in, in January because I didn't want to mess up. You know, I had hygiene scheduled for six months. I didn't think that was right to do that to the hygiene patients. So I let all that play out before we did it. Man, that whole six months, we were, you know, we were studying. We were timing procedures. Um, I developed all this uh I've got little uh, examples, right? So we developed all these cool color-coded templates. Um, we we used these. We used we used everything we could. Like I studied Toyota like crazy. Everything we could do to to be able to process more people through the building at lower prices. Uh, so we still kept our production up, only working the three days a week. And son of a gun, if we didn't go up two hundred fifty thousand that that year of two thousand eight. And so then, I mean, I thought, you know what, uh, this is the ticket. So I just sort of put it on cruise control. And from 2008 to 2013, everything was great, amazing. Um, and then, like you alluded to, uh, one night in May 2013. So you were producing around $250,000 by yourself, or did you have other associates helping you? No, $250,000 per year. We went up $250,000 for the year. Oh, got it. We went from, from five days to three days, but went up 250000 a year. Back in got those yes. So we were, you know, we we were doing um, upper, close, we were bumping on $2 million, uh, Yeah. back in those days. $2 um, million by yourself? Yes, we had, but we had, we had 14 operatories. I, I'm the only dentist, right? I'm telling <laughs> you, man, we had these systems down. We had these systems, they were, well, now four ops were ortho. So I got into ortho back in 2005 and, and it was a good decision for me because that's like the only high dollar thing that anybody around here actually will do that, that I've found that I can get them to do. So uh, we had four ortho ops and then 10 that I was, you know, I think three hygienists and then seven that I was working out of consistently. Um, and yeah, wow. it, was a, I know it, it sounds crazy. Uh, I had doctors down, man, I've had doctors came down to see the show, right? Uh, I've had doctors from, I think, 30-something states and every province in Canada have been to Ripley, Mississippi, of all places, to see that when it was when it was hopping, you know, when we were just, um, you know, felt like we were smart. We felt like we were doing really amazing stuff, um, you know, I, but, but you can't, like I say, you can't plan for a, an act of nature. And so uh, yeah. I found out nope. the hard way. Yeah, so sound like um, sound like you you're very very efficient to uh, for Doctor Woody Oaks to uh, title you the most efficient dentist in dentistry. Uh, so so maybe I should fly down there to uh, to observe you someday. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I 
So it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same after the fire. Yeah. I only built back. Uh, I only built back nine ops. Nine and, ops. Uh, yeah, nine ops is all we got now. So it's not. It's not. It's not the show it was, man. It was. It was something to behold, but it's. It's no longer exactly what it used to be. I just. Uh, I just couldn't bring myself to build back that many ops, and uh, I decided I never. I, I. I tried the associate route, and I just decided I didn't really think I ever wanted an associate. So. We're just sitting here having fun with nine ops these days, man. It wouldn't be the same. Are Are you still as efficient as before, though? Do you still have the energy and the motivation to uh, to practice the same as before? Well, I'll tell you, it's it's a weird deal, man. If you ever have a life changing experience like that, um, if you lose your practice overnight, uh, yeah. the part that I underestimated was the mental impact. Like I always thought I was kind of a go getter and a lot of energy and, and stuff like that. Um, before the fire, you know, I was kind of in your shoes, you know, I had the, had the podcast and, uh, and seminars. We, we put on a gosh, that year before the fire, we had a seminar in Nashville, Tennessee with 225 doctors attending. Um, I mean, I thought things were going so well and they were going great, but man, I'll tell you that fire fighting, the insurance companies for 16 months to get paid and having a policy that I don't know what I could have done different. Maybe I could have become a lawyer on the side and learned how to read a contract, but I had all these, these maximums and stuff. And so um, 14 ops, 7,500 square feet paid off, mind you, I had paid the loan completely off. I was out of debt 100%. And uh, the, the, I only had $300,000 of coverage on the building. Uh, oh wow so you can imagine 300 grand yeah. for 7500 square feet it's not gonna you know so yeah so you know it torpedoed so i'm sitting there man i'm bleeding cash uh for yeah. 16 months bleeding cash trying to get back into town like we had to move seven miles out of town and renovated a nurse practitioner's office uh, into it was a 1250 square feet and we actually squeezed six ops out of that but still man it was just I had a, uh, you know, uh, like 17 employees at the time. They slowly left. They couldn't take it. We were sharing one bathroom, one bathroom, man. Are you kidding me? It was so bad. It was so bad. Um, and so, yeah, man, it's been the thing we got, we got, we finally, we rebuilt It's a beautiful building. I just paid it off in July. <laughs> so happy about Good. that. Of course, of course now my kids are in college, right? So, uh, yeah. I'm still pretty broke, but, uh, but yeah, we got it paid off. We got a good staff back. Everything's back on track. But I have, I, I will be honest, it has been really hard for me mentally to get back. It has just been this year, Nathan, that I've been able to get back focused. You would be shocked. It is such a huge difference. If you're not focused every day, if your mind is not constantly working on how do I bring in new patients, how do we work in this extra stuff, you know, if I'm not on my game when I'm diagnosing in hygiene, I just don't diagnose as much. And and I'm, it's not like, I don't know why that is, but if I'm just not in a good place mentally, the practice just cannot operate the same. Um, and so it would be nice if the practice had such amazing systems that it could, but I have to be on my focus game. And uh, luckily this year, it's really gotten back to where it needs to be. But boy, it was a, it was a long, hard journey. I'll be honest. I'm glad. Uh, so uh, make sure you have a, a, a great uh, insurance policy in place now. <laughs> Man, go read that thing tomorrow. I, have, I tell you what, I've lectured since then, and I've had a few dentists come up to me or email me afterwards and say, you know what, I had the same problem you did in my policy, and I fixed it, and uh, I really owe you one. Of course, I'm like, well, I hope your practice never burns down, but I'm glad you got it fixed just in case. <laughs> awesome. So, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you are fully recovered and on the road to help other dentists to, to practice, uh, to work less and make more, right? And to be happier as well. That's the plan. I mean, I've really enjoyed it. Um, for sure, those years between when I went to three days and the fire were just amazing. And that, that's the kind of thing I would like for every dentist out there who's working too much. Like I spoke at the uh, townie meeting in Orlando this year and I had had a, had a guy come up to me after the uh, meeting and he he's working five and a half days most weeks i mean it's just too much man it's just yeah. too much let me tell yeah. you hey nathan how old are you 36 36 okay 36 man i thought i was indestructible let me tell you 
you you keep pulling teeth another 10 years your, your hands gonna start getting going bad your elbows gonna start going bad i mean this thing doesn't last forever you got to take care of yourself uh and, and you have to find a way to recover you cannot you cannot pull a thousand teeth a year forever um yeah you know, working five days a week you gotta have some time to recover so I, my advice to everybody man take care of yourself because it this is a blessing it doesn't last forever you know what i believe you because uh before the the 10th year uh because i've been out for 10 years already before before the the 10 year i was feeling so strong right so strong and so healthy so i was talking to my friend who has been practicing dentistry for about uh 25 30 years and he said nathan wait until you hit the 10th year and now I feel it. My, my, my back is starting to crack and my, my neck, you know, I have to like rotate it to, to loosen it. So, uh, yeah, I believe you. So, so uh, speaking of taking care of yourself, what, what kind of exercises uh, do you do uh, routinely to, 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 to help your body? Well, I'll be, I mean, look, I'm not a workout warrior. Uh, I wish I were. <laughs> Uh, I work on the, I mean, I still do a lot of outside work and stuff uh, around the farm, but I do consistently, I tell you what, this thing changed my life. Uh, this Fitbit, ah. it's, it's, you know, it's got a cracked face. It's kind of ugly. You know, you'd think I would buy a nicer one, but uh, back in 2000 and um, I guess 15, I was at a seminar in Phoenix and I drove up and I was, I said, you know what, I'm going to try to hike down into the Grand Canyon and back out. And of course I was by myself and I realized I'm not in that good of shape. And so, uh, I thought I might actually pass away. Uh, I was like, I was, have you been on that bright angel trail before? No, no. Okay. So, you know, it's hot. And so there's like a, there, the rocks is really steep and there's these little, the rocks kind of lean out at the corners as it, um, as it works its way down and then back up. And there's a little bit of shade, not much, but it's like uh, maybe a hundred yards in between the, sh the patches of shade. Man, I was coming out of that Grand Canyon and uh, I, was, I was by myself, once again, kind of stupid, but uh, I was just, I would make it from shade to shade, a hundred yards, and I would just lean up against that rock. My heart was, I don't know, 100, 150 plus, I'm sure. And, and I, I finally made it out of there. I didn't die. And uh, I said, Chris, you got to get in better shape. So I got a Fitbit. And, um, and so now I walk, you know, I do 10,000 steps on like today, I'll do 10,000 steps tonight when I get home. And then, uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I do 15,000 steps. And so that's, you know, I do that. Um, I try to eat somewhat okay sometimes and that's, that's about it. Um, uh, but, uh, it's a lot better than it used to be. I'll be out, you know, it's better. You know, as efficient as you are at the practice, you must be uh, running around a lot. <laughs> Well, I, you know, my hallway at the, at the office is 110 feet from the hygiene ops to my ops. And so I did that. I kind of did that on purpose. That's not that efficient, but it makes me walk back and forth a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, um, steps in. Yeah. So uh, the next question that I have for you is, uh, can you tell me how you got into speaking to teach other dentists? Oh, I tell you, I, I've sold this before. Uh, do you like, do you know, Howard Fran? You like Howard? Yeah, I just interviewed him uh, a couple of weeks ago. All right, so Howard, like one of the best, most amazing guys on the planet, uh, love Howard Friend. I would do anything for Howard Friend if he asked me. He, he's never asked me. He probably doesn't need me to do, help him do anything. But um, I, he, I had uh, I, my first speaking engagement ever was uh, like 2002 in Houston, Texas. And I was speaking at a seminar put on by Dr. Scott Perkins. And uh, Scott had this theory that warm sodium hypochlorite dissolved pulpal tissue better than cold sodium hypochlorite. And he had me run all these experiments uh, back in Mississippi. He did some stuff and I did, I did some experiments. And when I got down, I was going to reveal my findings, you know, in front of everybody. And, um, and I had about a 45 minute lecture planned out to do that. Now this is the most boring topic on the planet, right? You couldn't get more boring than dissolution time of sodium hypochlorite. But anyway, I get there. It's a pretty nice crowd. Guess who's on the front row? Who? Howard Ferran. <laughs> who, who happens to be my, one of my all-time heroes. And at that time, for sure my all-time hero. Um, he's on the front row. I had just listened to his 
30-day dental MBA cassette series on the way down there. Uh, I actually drove from Mississippi to Houston, right? I'd listen to that the whole way. I, and he's there on the front row. I can't believe it. So I start talking. And this is my, you got to imagine, I'm real bad at speaking. Or I'm terrible. Worse than now. A lot worse. And uh, <laughs> about, you know, about five minutes into it, old Howard, he's crossing his arms and then his head goes down. <laughs> and then about and then about 10 minutes into it his head goes back and he starts <laughs> snoring i mean snoring so loud everybody in the whole hall had to hear him everybody everybody heard <laughs> howard snoring and so i'm up there on stage trying to deliver this amazingly boring topic information and my all-time hero in dentistry is on the front row snoring so loud that people around him can't even hear me and I'm so embarrassed. I just want to leave. And I, but I'm like, you know what? It's time to suck it up. And you know, I played ball a lot growing up. It's just time to suck it up. You got to get through this, get home, forget about this speaking stuff, right? Uh, so anyway, I plow through it, get to the end, do my last slide, say, thanks, everybody. I'm walking off the stage. And all of a sudden, Howard Ferran on the front row somehow snaps to attention then he stands up and starts clapping and turns around to the audience and waves everybody up and had everybody <laughs> in the whole place give me a standing ovation. And I, I think it was just the endorphins released from the low, low of me being so embarrassed to the, you know, everybody doing that. I just, I guess that's it. From then on, I had the bug and I figured, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to speak uh, as much as possible. And thankfully, uh, five or six years later, I had something worth talking about. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think he, he wasn't sleeping. He, uh, he was just closing his eye, but listening inside. <laughs> <laughs> he, may, he may have been. I don't know. Howard's amazing. He may can do things that normal humans cannot. Now, before I ask you the next, uh, the next questions, what, what's up with the flying? Because you're going to speak at Emily's event in December, <laughs> and you're going to drive 17 hours to get there. And when you spoke at, uh, that, at that event in Houston, you drove from Mississippi to Houston. So I have severe motion sickness problem, and I just hate flying. I hate it, but I still fly. But it seems like you don't fly at all. Well, I did fly. You know, in 2002, I drove to Houston because I was broke. Uh, <laughs> and uh, since then, I've flown. Since then, I've flown about fourteen times in my life. Uh, but the last time I flew was to Tampa, Florida, and uh, this ear right here blew out uh, on the way down. And and I've had bad ears my whole life. You know, whatever. Yeah. Everybody's got their own problems. But I'm yeah, you know, I'm nearly deaf. But I've got a really bad left ear, and it was so bad for three days. Like you said, the motion sickness. I could almost not stand up. I almost yeah. couldn't get off the bed. And uh, I said to myself, you know, Chris, if it's possible, I mean, if you, if it's an emergency, I'll fly. But if it's possible, let's just drive. And uh, I don't mind driving. Um, I get to catch up on my seminars. I get to catch up on my coffee break podcast. Uh, you know, last year, uh, I, last year I drove to California. Uh, I drove to Boise, Idaho uh, at different time. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm 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 scared. I'm speaking in uh, Dothan, Alabama, which is almost as far as Miami. The week before, I'm speaking in Miami, or uh, um, wherever it is. It's Estero, Florida. But yeah, yes. I mean, I I don't mind. I don't mind it. I kind of like driving. Um, if there was an emergency, man. If you if you said, Chris, I gotta have you in three hours because my practice is gonna explode if I don't. I would get on a plane for you, Nathan. But barring <laughs> that, I'm probably gonna keep driving. <laughs> that's very unique of you there <laughs> so um I, what i realized over time is uh is for any practice uh, or business uh, to be successful they have to have a great system in place i know the franchises uh, can't operate without a great system so what kind of system do you use to implement new system into your practice well okay so so after the fire right i was in this terrible funk and I had to get out of the funk. I didn't know how. And so I said, Chris, you know, all these amazing efficiencies and systems you built, they're in danger of going away because mm. you're, you're about to let this practice just fall into nothingness. And so um, I actually went back all the way to undergraduate college 
um, when I was an engineering major, when I first started at Mississippi State University, I, I was in engineering at first before I got interested in dental. Um, and, and so I remember that, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that people did like in lean manufacturing. And I love lean manufacturing. I've studied it enormously. I don't know. There's probably a few people in dentistry that know it as well or better than me, but not many. Uh, and so I went back to those systems and there's, and so I got to study and what could I do? And, and I wanted to get my staff on board, right? So I'd lost my team and I needed, and I had new people and they had never really experienced growth. I don't think they understood what growth meant. Um, and so I said, okay, I, so I sort of took, I took a lean management principle named uh, Kanban which uh, is really a system that was built out for companies like Toyota, but it was adopted by people in Silicon Valley to build software. And there's another term that I'm boring everybody to death, but it's a term called Scrum. And so that's sort of a version of Kanban that was adapted by software engineers. And that's why, um, let's see, I've got it on my, see the little, uh, the red dots, right? The red dots everywhere on your phone. Yeah. And so that's that back in the day, Nathan, before you were blowing and going, we updated Dentrix once a year by them mailing us a disc and us putting it in the server and spinning it and updating our computer. And of course now everything's updated like instantly, like your phone, the little red dots. And yeah. so that scrum Kanban system, that's what the software engineers adopted in Silicon Valley to do that. Okay. So I, I took that, that principle, okay, this is obviously a very good way to build out new systems. And it was time for new systems, man. We needed an overhaul bad. Uh, so how do we get the team motivated to do this? Okay. I mean, cause it's like, if I just introduce this, they're going to say, Oh, I'm maxed out already. What are you doing this? Why are we doing more? <laughs> and so I took a little trick that I learned from studying Walt Disney and also Steve Jobs and uh, sprinkled that, the little uh, Disney pixie dust on the whole process and found a way that we could actually get the team to take these big concepts that we wanted to implement in the practice and be bonus, like we give them bonus money on top of their regular pay, and we give them time too. That's important, time to work on it outside of seeing patients. And the team, the team members, they actually pull these projects through to – fruition instead of me saying hey go mm. figure out how to do this we put a project on the board we split it up into individual tasks the team members grab the task they're bonus depending on how hard the task is that they move across the board from you know it's originally it's a project then it's to do it's this little task then we're doing it and finally it's done and once it's done they get paid their bonus money uh, we talk about what happened. It's a great we do with the we call retrospective meetings. Uh, these it's just an amazing way to practice. And so we started doing that a few years ago, and that man that that helped me too because you know a decade ago Nathan I I could drive everything, but now I need some help. So I really needed my team to help me drive the practice, and that is what this Silicon Valley system did uh, for us. We we call it so I it's been so successful for me. And then also a lot of other people we've taught it to I actually put it into a book. And so, uh, I got the mock-ups for the cover. I, I'll show you. I got the mock-ups, um, today. So I'm hoping awesome. this book is going to be uh, done by the end of October. So when I'm speaking like in Miami, I can give people this book and, uh, it'll be like additional from what you know, I can't explain it super well in an hour. Uh, but this yeah. book, a little hundred page book and it'll I'm hoping it'll really help a lot of people get their team motivated to drive practice growth by implementing very important systems and getting away from getting away from just dentists and staff just only doing the urgent stuff putting out fires all day I know it's pain it's so crazy man I cannot talk if there's ever a roadblock to this it's because I cannot convince a dentist to take one hour a week to set aside and let's work on the practice for one hour a week, right? They just about won't do it. They'll usually lie to me and tell me they're going to do it, but they just about won't do it. The ones that do it and they set up this kind of a system in their practice, that's the ones that take off. Wow, that sounds very unique because um, what I realized over time is it, you, you, no one can do everything by himself, right? 
And the second thing is, it doesn't matter matter how talented you are, how good you are. You won't have you won't, you won't have enough time to do everything by yourself. So you have basically have to build a team with the talent around you to create the projects that you that you want to to push forward. So sound like your bonus system is is based on the projects uh, and not so much on production collections and number of new patients no. like like most Dennis. Oh yeah, no, I mean we did that right. Uh... I've made so many mistakes. Uh, we used to do the big bonus where you had a, you know, you, you had like a big pool of money after you paid the practice bare minimum and whatever, 20% and you gave them 20% of this bonus pool. We did that. You know what the problem with that bonus is, Nathan, after a while you have like five employees and they're splitting this $800 bonus every month, right? Down equally. Yeah. Well, guess what happens as the practice grows you can't convince these people that you need to hire somebody else. I've seen it happen so many times. It happened to me, happened to so many of my friends. When you're growing, they don't want to hire anybody else. Even if they tell you it's fine, they will treat that person so bad. The person usually will quit. And so it just causes problems. Uh, It's great at first causes problems later. Another bonus I was on for years is where as the practice grows, you give people like a 20 cent per hour raise every, as the practice goes, you know? And, and so the people, if you're making 50,000 a month, the problem with this bonus is the people that when you're making 50,000 a month as they're they're when you're making 150,000 a month, they're making way too much money. There's no way if you're, if you were paying them a good living wage at 50,000 and now they're getting triple pay, uh, they're not working triply as hard. They cannot. It's impossible. So, so then you have to hire more people to pick up the slack of this huge growth. Well, the new people up here at 145, they can't ever make as much as the people that came in at 50. And there's just a lot of internal resentment. So that bonus was a disaster too. Um, it, I like it. One, I was on the new, we did the new patient bonus for a long time too. Uh, nothing wrong with that. We ran into some issues we did run into issues with it too. The issues ran in there were like the, the one person it, there was all, no matter what I did, there was one person who really wanted that bonus money and, and she would go after it, boy. And the problem was I would have people coming to me behind the scenes saying, it's really not right. You know, she grabs all the phone calls and I've said something and she just, you know, it, it doesn't matter no matter what I say. I know you said we're supposed to be even about it, but, this one person wanted to grab all the phone calls and it caused internal dissension. And also that was only a front office bonus, right? For the new patients. So we tried to figure out a way to do the back staff and it just, it just eventually fell apart. The beauty of this new bonus system, the Silicon Valley bonus system that we came up with is that it's based on project implementation. So if people want bonus money, that's great. We've got projects that need implemented. And as we pay them bonus money, we're getting these projects implemented. It's like going to a seminar, filling it up with great ideas and coming home. And instead of it sitting on your bookshelf, getting dusty, which is what mine used to do, you hand it off and uh, the staff takes those great ideas and they make them come true just for a little extra. And you don't mind paying a little extra, right? When awesome stuff happens. No, I love it. I love your bonus system idea there. Wow. That's great. And that's the first time that I actually heard uh, something like this. So awesome. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce, uh, help you introduce this one to the dental community. Uh, I, think, I think it's a great idea. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about marketing real quick. Uh, in order to grow and have a lot of patience, we got to do some kind of marketing, whether it's external or internal, right? So what, what, what have you been doing lately that's been working for your practice? Well, so, so guess what I found out, right? So I, my practice was in great shape before the fire. I had quit marketing pretty much. We had pretty much quit marketing. I was, we're getting referrals just left and right. That's so I'm like, that's the best anyway. Right. So that's yeah. all I cared about. Um, I got lazy. I admit it. So we had the fire. We're off 16 months and we come back and, you know, we just didn't have a lot of patients left. I mean, they wouldn't drive the seven miles and they went somewhere else. And so I did not have the big mass of humanity to throw off the referrals anymore. And the practice just, it was down. And uh, so I said, okay, no problem. 
let's just, you know, let's, let's go back in time to 2003, 2004, when you were getting 150 new patients a month, no big deal. Uh, well, guess what I was doing in 2002, uh, three, three and four, Nathan. And you tell me if you think it would work now. 2003. Wow. Back then you got, back then you got, you must be doing yellow pages or something. Or I was doing some yellow pages, but I was also like, especially 2005, I was running ads in the newspaper ah, that said, mm -hmm. come in for your free exam and free x-rays. That was pretty groundbreaking in 2004 and five, man. I got to tell you, we got 150 new patients a month, four years doing that. I mean, it was crazy. Well, <laughs> guess what? It does not work in 2016, 2017. Mm. That, uh, that you couldn't even find a newspaper to advertise in if that would work, uh, yeah. which I'm sure it wouldn't. So we tried a few things and it still wasn't working. And, um, and so one day, I finally said, you know, Chris, you've known this for a while. In my opinion, most of the people are on social media these days. Uh, most people in my area, at least, are on Facebook all the time. Uh, I hate Facebook. I hated Facebook so bad. I did barely had an account. I just had an account sitting there. I didn't really even want to do it. But I said, okay, well, you got to do something, right? And so uh, I sort of, I, I really immersed myself. I actually spent $13,000 on uh, courses over the past year learning how to do social media and Facebook ads. And and then I spent another $5,000 this year testing different kinds of ads before we got a hit. Uh, now the good news is we got a hit and uh, we got a couple of hits and like we're working on getting the bases loaded now. So we have, we have finally cracked sort of, I hate to say crack the code. I mean, I'm sure there's it could go bad tomorrow and whatever, but we finally have found some consistent Facebook ads that we're able to run and uh, we get a consistent flow of uh, new patients, reactivated patients. Some of the ones are coming back that left me. Right. Um, and it's just been really, really fun to learn this new media because I, I mean, I don't know, I know you are amazing at social media, but I was a complete social media dunce. Um, <laughs> but I'll be, I'm proud to say, you know, Hey, we just went over, I don't even know it's good. So I might be embarrassing myself, but we just went over like 2,100 fans on our uh, fan page at the dental office. And, um, and, and we're getting, we're getting about, I guess, I, I guess about 30 new patients uh, slash reactivated patients a month off of that. And uh, now cool. we're, our, our ad spend is only, um, our ad spend is only a couple of hundred dollars a month. And the ROI on that is 40, 50, um, 40, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, not 40 or 50, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, what is Aspen? $200. So yeah, 30, 40, 50 to 50, uh, ROI. That's awesome. One. Yeah. So, uh, for uh, the dentists that, that's, that's all watching this, this interview right now, they're going to be wondering what, what are you doing that actually working right now? What, what kind of ad are you running? Well, um, maybe it's just Mississippi. I don't know. But so I run one ad uh, that advertises our membership, right? Our mm. uh, monthly membership. Now, uh, yeah. it used to be the membership was a big deal. It used to not be a thing. So one thing we do a little bit differently, and I'll share this as a trick, right? Uh, but you guys use it. I, nobody much wants to do this either, but I'm telling you guys, it is a winner. Um, most, how do you, do you have a, an in-office membership plan, Nathan? We do. We have, we call it a smile savings plan. Okay. Do you do, a, do you charge a yearly fee or do you do it monthly? Well, we do it yearly. Uh, basically it's $75 a year uh, for exam and x-ray only. It, it doesn't include a cleaning. Okay. Well, doesn't that, that your, your specific, the details of your plan that that's not important. Yeah. 99 of dentists do it yearly right yeah yeah so if a person uh, it's just an advantage you have over everybody else if you will take the time to learn how to do a monthly recurring payment plan you will be able to say in your ads hey uh, come in get a free first month and uh and then it's only in mine it's only 16.97 a month after that right it's very attractive yeah. front and, over, uh, oh, and that oh, yeah. has been are probably our biggest 
ad. We also run ads um, for implants and for clear braces. And uh, those we've sort of, I'm an old, uh, like I say, man, I'm old, right? Uh, I'm 45. Hey. <laughs> you don't look old. You look like 35. Well, I've, well I, in 10 years, tell me if you feel old, Nathan. <laughs> but, so back in the day, we did a lot of direct mail because I'm a big Dan Kennedy, Bill Glazer guy. I love those guys. I used to be in Bill Glazer's mastermind. Dan Kennedy taught it for a while. Um, those names may not mean anything to you, but they used to be really popular. Um, and direct mail was the, that was the way that they taught you to make money. And so what we do now is I will drum up business online on Facebook. We'll try to get people to raise their hand and say, Hey, I would like some information about implants. I would like some information about clear braces. And then we take them offline and we send them, you know, the first thing you do, by the way, you got to have good phone skills, right? Yeah. So you need to, you need to be, you, as soon as somebody raises their hand, you're calling saying, Hey, I just wanted to verify your address and all this and, and maybe schedule them right then. Some people you do. If not, send them a package. Uh, Dan Kennedy would call it a shock and awe package, which is, it's a nice, nice package. It, it's, uh, it, when you open it, it, it has all kind of cool stuff. It shows the people how awesome you are. We finally found a good use for our new patient brochures, you know, and <laughs> we put a little coupon in there and stuff. Um, and then we follow up again. Hey, did you get your package? And uh, we just strike up a conversation. Now, this takes a couple of months to get rolling, right? Because the first month, you may send out 50 report packages. Uh, but just keep following up, and they're going to start trickling back in. And then after a couple of months, you're going to have a consistent flow. Uh, I even turned off. I turned off my implant ad this month because my staff, we just, we really, we, we really got to the point where, look, uh, I don't like it when people call and they can't get an appointment. I hate that. Yeah. I hate it. Uh, and so we had to actually turn that ad off because he's getting a little tight and, uh, and you know, we want to spend time with those people. So, um, I have, I'm just, I'm just loving Facebook. Uh, I'm loving the way it does. I know there's a lot of people out there that are experts at it better than me, but, um, I, I like I said, I spent 13 grand on courses. I spent 5,000 testing and it's coming back big time ROI. That's great. That's really good. Uh, sound like yeah, you're getting a lot of new patients and a lot of old patients coming back. Uh, and uh, that's, that's actually a great problem to have, uh, not having enough appointment slot for them. <laughs> it, it is. It's the first day. Hey, I was a surprise. It's probably the first time that's happened since 2008, right? It's just, it just but uh, you know, hey, Facebook works, but it's a lot of work to get it to work. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, the next question says, uh, for the new dentists uh, out there or, or students that are about to graduate from dental school, what kind of advice would you give them uh, if, they, if, if they wanted to open their own, own practice? Because these days, the debt is really high and it costs a lot to open a dental practice. And, and most, most dentists, they don't have any business experience. They don't have any, most don't have any business skill to get into business. So what kind of advice would you give them? I, I tell you, Nathan, uh, look, I mean, I don't know. The only thing I could say is it was different in 1998, uh, I guess. I mean, I I worked when I was in dental school. I worked nights. And so when I graduated, my debt was not much, $60,000. Yeah. Okay. And right now I have people tell me that they owe $600,000. I don't even know yeah. what to think about. It. It's like, are you kidding? I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's so, that's such a bad position to be in. Uh, I love dentistry and I know when the practice burned in 13, it's not the same because I had a following. I didn't lose everybody, uh, but building it back, it seemed, it was tough. And I will tell you that um, I wouldn't even try it. If you can't get in a place mentally where you are literally willing for a few years to just do the worst stuff that you hate. <laughs> I mean, I used to only want to do the stuff I wanted to do too, right? I mean, but you cannot make a living just doing the easy stuff that makes a lot of money and referring everything else out. It's just not going to work. You've got, you've got to, you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, for five years, go to all the preschools, read the kids books, be in the rotary club, uh, be in the parade, uh, do coach for kids at the office. I was, I actually, 
I didn't even think of this, but I mean, like 2010, I got the uh, Mississippi Humanitarian of the Year Award because of this is the kind of stuff I did. Because you've got to, you've got to go above and beyond. Times are hard, but the people that are willing to really hustle and really work, I mean, you're going to come out on top no matter what. Because your brain's going to always be working. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? You know, after a while, you're going to hit it big, and you'll get to live like a doctor eventually. But hey, look for we lived in a house. My wife and I raised our first, we had our first kid in a house that cost $33,000. It was about a thousand square feet. It was about 60 years old in a bad part of town. And I did that for five years, right? Because you just can't come out of school in a lot of debt and start throwing that money around. You got to, you know, use some common sense. I don't know. People may not want to hear that. I don't know. Uh, but I truly believe if you, if you're focused and I know you guys are smart anyway, if you're focused and you're willing to do whatever it takes for a few years, you'll never fail. But if you come out and you just, you know, you, like we used to say in basketball, if you just want, if you just want to throw your sneakers on the court and expect to win, that's probably not going to happen. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really – I love talking to the young dentists. It really gives me a lot of energy and motivation, too. And I know things are so different. But the one thing that I've seen that doesn't change, the successful people, they're all hustlers. They all really work hard for a while anyway. You know, that's exactly what How, how a friend said uh, three weeks ago when I interviewed him. Uh, you got to work hard. You got to put in the time and effort, right? And what I got from you today is you got you to gotta focus. Because if you're not focused – yeah, things not gonna happen uh, like like you want it, and and you gotta be a great leader to lead your team and have a system in place because if not, you're gonna have chaos not only at your practice but probably probably in your life as well, right? So uh, before we end this interview, I like to ask you my favorite questions, and that is, what makes you happy in life now? Oh my goodness! Well, it would make me happy if Mississippi State. Uh, would start running the football instead of trying to throw it all over the field and losing football games they shouldn't lose. But I'm just <laughs> joking. Coach Moorhead, I'm, I'm picking at you. I'm sorry. But, no, um, I tell you what makes me happy, Nathan, is it's not – okay, when you get to a certain level, it's definitely not the money. That's really nothing. It's It's a consistent success every day. Like, every day you feel like when you when you leave the office – you succeeded. You helped people. You grew the practice. On my days off, you know, I maybe I maybe I uh, worked on my speaking. Maybe I worked on some of my courses. Maybe I went fishing with my dad. You know, you gotta. Maybe my son's in town from college. Maybe I did something fun with him. Just every day, make the most out of every second you've got. Um, and if you do that over and over enough times, one of these days you're going to look up and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe I did all that. And uh, it's going to be pretty cool. Wow. What Emily would uh, describe you uh, is you are a high performer, you are intentional, and you have a purpose. That's great. Those are great lessons. So uh, thank you so much. Before we end this interview, do you have any last words? Uh, how, how, can our, how can our members contact you? Oh, well, um, it, you know, you can, okay, my, I've got a podcast, um, awesome. and you guys, listen, so Nathan is going to be on my podcast right after this, so it's kind of like a part one, part two, so come <laughs> on over, the website is uh, drchrisgriffin.com, and uh, come on over and listen to part two of this podcast, right, that's the best way to get a hold of me, if I've got contact information there, and, and anything else you'd want to look at. Awesome. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you so much for this interview. We really appreciate you for sharing your story and all the ad great advice with us. And I also appreciate everyone for watching this Coffee Break interview video podcast with Dr. Chris Griffin. Until next time, take care.